Hello and welcome to the recording studio of the Mozarteum University in Salzburg. With this video, we, the students of the Viola da Gamba class, and our professor Vittorio Gielmi, would like to share with you some new elements of reflection about the Viola da Gamba technique. I have to thank the research group of Mozarteum and the library of Mozarteum, but of course uh, the European project Violanet, who supported uh, our labo laboratories uh, in the university in the last three years. And uh, these laboratories are the basis of this video. We worked on the sources and on the repertoire, trying to clarify some fundamental pillars of the Viola da Gamba technique. In this and the following videos, we will point out the technical elements which we consider in need of a deeper analysis and trying to see them in a new light. One widely spread belief is that with the viola da gamba bow grip, it is not possible to do all of the jumping bow strokes as it is with all other bowed string instruments. This is affirmed even by one of the most important studies on the subject the fundamental volume of Hans Boll. He says, for avoiding all misunderstandings, I point out that the vial technique doesn't know any spiccato bowing. With this short video, we will try to show that not only is it indeed possible to do all of the jumping bow strokes, but that this was somehow the basis of the viola da gamba bow technique, according to some ancient sources. This idea becomes clear when we think that at least until the generation of Mare Mare, the viol was considered to be a bowed loop. The degree of nobility of an instrument was connected to its quality and length of resonance. This is clearly stated by Hubert Leblanc as late as 1740. When struck free, the string produces more resonance. The harmonic partials are pure. On the contrary, during the action of the bow, those harmonic waves are disturbed. It is for this reason that until the 17th century, the lute was considered to be the king of instruments, followed by the viola da gamba. The violin, however, wasn't considered a noble instrument until the end of the 17th century. This vision lasted even longer within the upper classes of the French society, sometimes until the revolution. This is why the bow in order to produce more resonance, has to start from the air and finish in the air. This is clearly stated by Leblanc in page 23. The playing of a French gamba virtuoso marin mare is described as tic-tac par les coups d'archer enlevés et tout en l'air. Tic-tac, so extremely short strokes with lifted bow strokes and all in the air. As we will see in a second video, this phrase of Leblanc is completely confirmed by new sources discovered during researches supported by the Mozarteum University. Other sources clarify the necessity for lifting the bow off the string in order to add clarity to the music. One such of these is Christopher Simpson. In his Division Vial book, he says, you must allow so much stiffness to the wrist as may command the bow on and off the string, at every note, if occasion so require. Of course, the many ways of lifting a bow, of rebounding and jumping, should be deeply analyzed within different historical periods and styles, as we do in our research laboratories. But in this short video, we just want to attract the attention of the gamba players to the fact that the rebound of the bow has to be the essential part of their technical study if they want to master with freedom all styles and composers. Coming back to Hubert Leblanc and his Défense de la Basse de Viol, on page 83 he mentions Michel Machiti, a violinist and a contemporary of Forqueret in Paris. He recalls that Machiti would play 30 notes in one single legato bow, and in the same amount of bow, Marais and Forqueret were looking for one note, but with a resonance as big as the big bell of Saint-Germain. Jouant en l'air ainsi qu'il le recommandait, which means playing in the air as they recommended it. During the second half of the 18th century, the gamba style became much more influenced by the violin style, and this sort of legato playing 
and the composer started writing the jumping passages in a much more explicit ways, just as for violin music. This is evident especially with the German composers, such as Abel, Graun, Lidl, Telemann and so on. But also in some French viol sources or more ancient composers as Johann Schenk. Let's go through a few of them. This is a viola da gamba concerto by Johann Gottlieb Graun in A major. You see in the first tutti there is a very fast jumping passage in the violin. And when the solo comes, you see that it is exactly repeated with the same jumping notes. We have later many other passages where also jumping notes are marked. Here we have a very nice one. And then again, the same passage as the beginning, played from tutti and from the solo, one immediately after the other, exactly with the same marking for the jumping notes. The second example is taken for another ground concerto, this time in D major. In the last movement, Allegro assai, we have also a very interesting passage with flying jumping notes. This is once more a ground concerto in F major. You can see in this line of the solo a lot of different combination of jumping written with different marks. This is another example of background, but this time taken by chamber music. It's a quintet when uh, you have two alternative uh, voices for braccio, viola da braccio, or for gamba, viola da gamba. This is especially interesting because you see one line above the other, and you see that the writing for the two instruments is absolutely identical, and the same jumping notes are marked. This next example is taken from Abel, and you see also the use of jumping note under a slur. Now we see three different examples taken from Andreas Lidl, a viola da gamba and baritone virtuoso of the late 18th century. In this first you see many different markings for different combination of jumping bow strokes. In this second example, we are taken from a minute some very virtuoso combination of slur and jumping bowings. And in the third, again, series of fast jumping notes. As said, this was not just typical of the German players. We have in Paris a very late manuscript for two gambas, which also contains a lot of combination of virtuoso jumping bows. Like here, or here. But if we imagine that this happened just in late time, we make a mistake. If we open the pages of the Nouveau Quatuor by Telemann, we can also note a lot of combination of uh, fast jumping notes. This is one in a fast movement, and this other example in a middle slow one. As we have seen, there is no difference in the way of writing the jumping passages for the music of viol or the instruments of the violin family. And so we can conclude that the capability of jumping with the bow was not exclusive to an overhand or an underhand bow grip. But we can go even further and affirm that the underhand bow grip is even more suitable for having strong articulation and a fast and elegant jumping bow. The underhand bow grip was the most frequent grip as of Ortello till 18th century, as demonstrated already in 1995 by Mark Smith in his article on cello play underhand. The underhand grip was not used just by the cello continue players, but also by famous virtuosi, such as Pietro Salvetti in Florence, Antonio Bandini, the cellist of Taltin in Padua, or Georg Christoph Schetke, whose virtuoso, the flying and speaking botanic, is precisely described by a witness still in 1799. It is not by chance that during the formation of the modern orchestra in the German-speaking countries, the underhand grip survived for the biggest instrument, the double bass. 
has a stronger grip for an instrument demanding a lot of energy for the articulation. It's also very significant that the most percussive string instrument, the Uto Gardon, still surviving in Transylvania and Hungary, a kind of percussive cello, is still played with underhand bow. If this grip were not ideal for jumping, they would have found a different one. So let's see now in few steps how to learn to jump with the viola da gamba bow grip. Um, a jump is of course uh, um, combined by two components, a vertical movement and an horizontal one. So the vertical one has to be produced by an active um, movement of the finger who keep the stick, like this. The horizontal one is nothing else the, the one you use when you simply make a pousse and tire. But you have to focus that the arm is very active and um, that the, the wrist and the hand doesn't make any interference movement, like this. Now we try to combine these two components and uh, we will have this first effect. For the moment, we still don't have a very nice musical effect. And um, nevertheless, it's very important you learn to do it and to keep in mind um, in a separate way, so to say, the two movements, what the hand makes and what the arm makes. Now we introduce a third movement in order to create a sweeter landing on the string that will produce a fuller and rounder sound in this way. This uh, third motion is just um, uh, a sweeter motion of the wrist with follow a little bit uh, the bow in the moment uh, uh, it touches the string. This is an active rebounding which in Italian is called balzato. It can be used for medium and for medium fast tempo. If you want to go very fast, your muscles won't be able to contract and release quickly enough, so you have to use a different source of energy. It's the elastic energy of the wood of the bow itself. However, if your bow is too light or too weak, it will be unusable for this kind of light bow strokes. So the fast rebounding, which, can, uh, which we can roughly call the sautillé, is produced by another source, which is actually the kinetic energy of the bow itself. But um, in order to let it burst, you have uh, to control a perfect adherence. So, paradoxically, the fastest jumpy come from the best legato. So, I start now with a fast note in a adherence, so legato, and then I leave, uh, I release a bit the tension um, of the bow and it starts jumping in this way. <laughs> If you have a choreic technique and use the real energy of your body and bow, the elastic rebounding and jumping of the bow is normal and the legato is somehow an exception. Each note has its articulation as a consonant and maybe that's the reason the legato always appeared in the tables of ornaments till the 18th century. It was considered a kind of exception, as we will see in the next video about the non of lay by Marais Marais. So from this you can develop all the possible variants. For example, uh, you can play very simple Pousset et Tire series, like this. By inserting some jumping note, which create dynamic. Or in some special case, 
you can just jump everything. Another thing that is very interesting, like explained by Roland Marais, is during the battery to underline by jumping the bass notes, like this. But you can also create a much sophisticated pattern. For example, you can have three jumping notes in a poussé stroke and one jumping in a tiré. And you have a very beautiful effect like this. For example, as we have seen in Schenk, you can have very long scales in one direction but jumping, which is a kind of jumping throne bow stroke. Or another typical jumping bow stroke we find very often in later composers, as we have seen, like Abel and so on, and is very similar to the violin staccato. Going up. And so on. This depends just from your fantasy and from the repertoire you are doing. Goodbye. Muitas gracias. Hasta luego. Adios. Das Vidania. Tschüss. Und auf Wiedersehen. Sayonara. See you soon. Tschüss. See. Adios. Au revoir. Tic-tac. Au revoir. <laughs> Arrivederci. <laughs> <laughs>